Good morning, church friends. This morning's worship service is going to be a little different and perhaps a little shorter than what you're used to. I managed to do a little damage to my knee yesterday and I'm facing some mobility problems and another member of our small worship team is also needing to take a short break for health reasons. So we are coming to you from a variety of locations, but I pray that this morning's worship will feed your spirit and your mind. Ephesians. I, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling one Lord, one faith, 
one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak, and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And this is a reading from the Gospel according to John. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? 
Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. That line never grows old, does it? Judy Garland's famous utterance when the fact that she has wound up someplace completely and utterly different from where she expected to be is one for the ages. And ever since the Wizard of Oz graced the silver screen the better part of a century ago, that line has been spoken on occasions where people find themselves in a space, be it physical, psychological, or spiritual, that is very different from where they expected to be. I think it might be a fitting line for today's gospel portion. It's important to read this passage, the opening lines of what scholars call the bread of life discourse in the Gospel of John in context. Last week we read the story that immediately precedes it. Jesus, with the help of a little boy who supplies five barley loaves and two fish, feeds 5,000 people in the wilderness. It's a miracle to be sure, and a very earthy one. In it, God partners with creation to satisfy one of creation's most basic and fundamental needs, the need for material food, in an extraordinary way. It points very much to how Jesus, God in the flesh, is like us, or more to the point how we are like him in his divinized humanity. But lest we think that this is all there is to our faith, today he takes things in a completely different direction. Do not work for the food that perishes, he tells us, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And when questioned about this mysterious food that endures for eternal life, he elaborates by saying, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now the continuity with last week's story is pretty obvious. We're still talking about food, but that's where the continuity ends. We're no longer talking about food in the normal sense of the word, the kind that when we eat it, gives our bodies a temporary nutritional bump and sustains them until the next time we eat. No, here we're talking about a type of sustenance that once received keeps the soul alive and well forever, well beyond the bounds of this mortal life. And here we reach the great paradox of our faith. Which is Jesus? A divinized human just like us? Or a humanized deity utterly above and beyond us? The answer is both. Last week we got more of the first side of this paradox. 
And the calling in that is what we already explored, to realize that we are not just God's creatures, but an active part of God's creativity. We are partners with the divine in creating and even in making miracles. And we are called to offer up whatever gifts God has given us for that purpose. But this week, we see the humanized deity, the one who, no matter how high we climb, will always be infinitely higher. And this humanized deity calls us to do something very simple, but something that is, given our human tendencies, perhaps even more difficult than partnering with God in making miracles. He calls us to receive, simply to receive. He doesn't just say that he has food for us. He says that he is food for us. And all we need to do with that food, all we even can do with that food, is receive it and take it. It is something so far beyond our ability to make or to control that we dare not do anything but receive it gratefully from the hand that offers it. The most obvious form that this food takes is, of course, the Eucharist. Yes, the Eucharist does, of course, involve some material elements of bread and wine that we had some role in producing or at least in procuring. But those material elements are simply the physical representation of us consuming something that we have no power to create, something that is given to us as pure gift. They are the physical representation of us eating the very substance of God. And unless the Holy Spirit comes to the table with us, as we trust that she does when in our hearts we invite her, the bread and wine are simply food that perishes. But when the Spirit comes, we are then consuming the food that endures for eternal life. So just as the encouragement from last week's gospel was to give of yourself, in order to be a co-creator with God, the encouragement in this week's is simply to receive. Receive that which we cannot make for ourselves, which we cannot earn, and which we cannot even begin to fathom. Receive it as pure gift from a giver whose grace is beyond all measure. And please know that while the formal Eucharist may be the most obvious time and place for this kind of receiving, it is hardly the only one. This food that endures for eternal life isn't contained within four walls, nor is it contained in a particular point in time. Jesus didn't say whoever comes to church on Sunday will never be hungry and whoever nibbles and sips at the altar rail will never be thirsty. He said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's the action verbs that count here. Come and believe. The spirit of Jesus is beckoning all of us somewhere. Of that, I am completely confident. Where is it for you? Once you have begun to discern that, go where that spirit beckons. And as you go, believe. Believe that no matter what is happening around you, you are going exactly where you belong. This is how we receive the food that endures for eternal life. 
Now you might ask, how we know that we have received this food? There's not too much I can say about that in a sermon. This is not something that human tools are capable of measuring or that words are capable of expressing. But I will say this much, you will know. Just pay close attention. You know that sensation you get when you're really hungry and you finally get to sit down to a good meal? Isn't there a deep satisfaction in your belly that tells you that an important need was just met? How much more so do we feel a deep satisfaction in our souls when their need for eternal sustenance is met? Watch for that satisfaction, that existential restlessness we so often feel subsides, and we know at least for a split second that we, that where we are, and more importantly, how we are, is exactly right. That is how we know that we have received the food that endures for eternal life. And let me make sure that I conclude with perhaps the most important point of all. You may be hearing all of this and wondering if you have ever experienced the sort of soul satisfaction that I'm talking about. Or perhaps you have, but it feels like eons ago. Let me assure you that if you desire and seek the food that endures for eternal life, someday and somehow you will find it. The one who gives it isn't stingy. He wants you to find it. He wants to give it to you. He will not let you go hungry forever. Keep seeking and you will find. Sisters and brothers, 
I invite you now to join me in prayer. In the silence that follows each bidding, please feel free to voice aloud the prayers of your heart or offer them up to God in silence. I invite your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for the Anglican Communion, for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, and especially for the Church of the Province of Southeast Asia, for the Episcopal Church and our diocese, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Mark, our bishop, and especially St. Aidan's Church in Bolinas, for the faith communities in our region, especially for Iglesia Pentecostus in Livermore. Please pray for all people in assemblies of faith. I invite your prayers for the world, for peace among all nations and peoples, for an end to wars and poverty and oppression, for wisdom and grace to be given to all in positions of public trust and power. Please pray for the world and its peoples. I invite your prayers for this congregation and its members, that we might continually grow in love for God and for one another. Remember especially these members in our weekly cycle of prayer. We pray for Mark, Abby, Jessica, Charlotte, Patrick. We pray for Jessica and Nesta, and we pray for Carol as well as those in military service. We pray for Aaron, Joey, Abigail, Valerie, Amber, Christopher, and Taylor. Please pray for our congregation and its people. I invite your prayers for all who respond to God's call to minister to others, that they may be protected and encouraged in the vital work that they do. Remember especially all nurses, doctors, police, firefighters, educators, Brad O and Brad S. Please pray for all who care for others in body, mind, or spirit. I invite your prayers for all those who suffer or struggle, that they might find relief and comfort. Remember especially Olivia, Becky, Bert and Judy, Brett M, Carol, Kathy, Dave and Mary, Doris, Aaron, Esteban, Miroslava and Tamara, Glennis, James, Ashley, Matt and Darian, for Geraldine, for Helen, for Umberto, Candida and family, for Janice and Bravo, for Jim, for Joanne, for Joe and Jake, for John and Hiroko, for Kip, for Lee, for Lisa B, 
for Laura, for Luke, for Marion, for Marge B, for Mary L, for Monty and Judy, for Nick, for Michael, Sandra and Henrietta, for Michael E, for Steve W and children, for Tamara S, for Robert, for Reverend Jennifer Nelson and family, and for the Christensen family. I also wish for prayers of deep gratitude for easily receiving the funds required for capital improvements at St. Bart's. And I wish a very happy 65th birthday to young John. And finally, I wish healing prayers for all God's children who have gone missing. May you all be rescued and feel God's warm love for you. Please pray for all those in need of tr- any need or trouble. I invite your prayers for those who have died, that they might find rest in the nearer presence of Christ, and on the last day rise together with us to the life immortal. Please remember especially Chalopi M., Clifford Willibus, and Chris C., Please pray for all the departed. I invite you to share with God your joys and your gratitude, calling to to mind all the ways in which God's amazing grace and generosity are felt in your life. Please pray in thanksgiving for all the blessings of this life.
St. Bartholomew's. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen.